while looking for inspiration for my next video, I stumbled upon this site that won site of the month back in 2021. It features a super clean, infinite parallax slider and the moment I saw it, I was hooked. It doesn't just move when you scroll, you can also hold and drag it around. What really caught my eye though was the subtle parallax motion. It gives the whole thing a smooth, dynamic sense of depth. As I was exploring it, I realized I have seen a similar effect before. A few months ago, we explored this portfolio site and broke down its landing page reveal animation. That one also had a really sleek parallax interaction where the inner image moves slower than the container itself. I thought this would be a fun concept to rebuild, so I built this super minimal infinite scroll slider that recreates the same parallax feel using just HTML, CSS and plain JavaScript, no GSAP or fancy libraries. It reacts to scroll direction but you can also drag it manually and it loops infinitely in either direction. I also made sure it's flexible enough to use for things like a project's showcase or even a team page. It's fully interactive, each slide is clickable and you can customize the route just by editing a simple array of objects. You can even build on top of it with page transitions and other effects if you want. We have covered those kinds of extras in past videos but for this one, the focus is just on the slider specifically how to achieve infinite scroll and parallax working together. If you find my work helpful, I would really appreciate a like and if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more breakdowns like this. And if you want to access the source code for this project plus hundreds of other similar micro projects and a new website template every month, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. Alright, let's get started. Let's start by setting up the basic HTML structure. The layout is pretty simple. The first thing I'll add is a nav element. It holds a logo on the left and a few navigation links on the right. These aren't functional in this demo, but they help give the layout a realistic structure. Next comes the main slider. I'm wrapping it in a div with the class of slider. This is where all the horizontal scroll animation happens. Inside it, there is a slide track container. This is the actual strip that will hold all the individual slides. We'll generate them dynamically using JavaScript, so we don't need to hard code any markup here. And finally, we'll add a footer at the bottom of the page. This just includes some simple placeholder text, again just for style. That's all we need in the HTML. Next, we'll move on to the CSS and start styling the layout before we generate the slides. We'll begin by resetting the base layout. I'll remove the default margin and padding and apply consistent box sizing to every element. Next, I'll set up the base styles for the page. We are using a dark theme here, solid dark background with white text to keep the focus entirely on the images. For the font, I'm going with DM Mono. Now I'll style the links in paragraph text. I want them to be small, bold and all uppercase so everything feels structured and consistent throughout the layout. We are also removing underlines and making sure the text color stays white for contrast. Let's take care of the nav and footer text. We'll position them both absolutely, nav pinned to the top, footer at the bottom. I'll stretch them full width and give them some internal padding for breathing room. We'll use flexbox to space the content out so the logo stays on one side and the links on the other. I'm also increasing the z index to make sure they stay layered above the slider content. Inside the nav, we have got a row of links. I'll space those out with a gap so they don't sit too close to each other. Now we'll style the slider section. This container takes up the full viewport width and height. We are hiding overflow to keep things contained and I'll disable text selection so the user can scroll and drag freely without highlighting anything. Inside it, we have got a slide track element that will hold all of our slides side by side. We'll populate this dynamically with JavaScript but for now, we just want to make sure it fills the slider and is set up as a horizontal flex container. Now for the slides themselves, each slide has a fixed width and height and we'll center it vertically using transform. I'm using flexbox here too, so the image and overlay stack vertically inside the slide. We'll prevent the slide from shrinking and I'll add a cursor pointer since each slide is clickable. Inside the slide, we have an image container. It fills the entire slide area and hides anything that overflows. I'll make sure the image inside scales up slightly. We want that zoomed in look, so we have room to create a parallax effect later on. We are also using build change transform to hint to the browser that this element will be animated, which helps improve performance. And I'm disabling user interaction on the image to avoid unwanted dragging behavior. Now we'll add the overlay that sits below the image. This holds the project title and the arrow icon. It's absolutely positioned, laid out using flexbox and centered vertically within its own area. By default, the overlay is fully transparent, but here is where we add a nice interaction detail. 
when the user hovers over a slide and only if the slider isn't currently in motion will fade in the overlay. That's handled using a custom CSS variable called slider moving, which will toggle through JavaScript. This makes the UI feel responsive without any flickering or hover bugs during track gestures. For the text inside the overlay, I'm keeping the style consistent, small, bold, and uppercase. The arrow icon is placed beside it and styled with a white stroke to keep it minimal and clean. And that's it for the styling. We now have a fully structured and styled layout with a fixed nav and footer. Next, we'll move on to JavaScript where I'll show you how we generate the slides, handle scroll and drag interactions and bring the parallax effect to life. Before we jump into the scroll logic and animations, we need to set up the data for our slides. So I've created a small array called slider data that holds the details for each slide we want to render. Each item in this array is an object with three keys, a title, an image path, and a URL. This is what we'll use to dynamically generate all the slides. So we don't have to hard code anything in the HTML. I have included eight sample slides here. Each one has a unique name and points to a different image. These are just placeholders for now, but you can swap them out with your own visuals or projects later. You'll also notice that all the URLs are pointing to the same sample page. You can update these links to lead to actual project pages, case studies, or whatever content you want the user to explore. We'll be looping through this array shortly to inject each slide into the DOM. I've also created a very basic sample project page just to complete the interaction. When you click on any of the slides, it will take you here. There is no real content, just a placeholder with a title and a backlink to return to the main slider. This is mainly for demo purposes. You can replace this with your actual case study or project detail page depending on what you are showcasing. Now let's start writing the JavaScript for our slider. The first thing I'll do is import the slider data array from the separate file we created earlier. This gives us access to all the image paths, titles, and links we defined for each slide. Right after that, we'll define a small config object. This is where I'm setting a few constants that will control the feel of the slider. Scroll speed controls how fast the slider responds to scroll input. Load factor determines how smooth or snappy the slide motion is. We'll use this in our animation loop to interpolate between current and target values. And max velocity limits how fast the slider can move when you scroll or drag really quickly. Next, I'll calculate the total number of slides by checking the length of our data array. We'll use this later when looping through and generating the slide elements. Now let's set up a central state object to track everything that's happening with the slider. We are storing the current X and Y positions which we'll use to smoothly animate the horizontal scroll. The slide width which controls the spacing between slides. We'll override this for mobile later. A slides array to hold all the slide elements we generate. Then we have a few flags related to dragging. Its dragging tells us if the user is currently holding down the mouse or touching the screen. Start X, last X, and last mouse X help us track drag position and movement. Track distance tells us how far the user has moved. We'll use this to prevent accidental clicks during a drag. We are also storing last scroll time, is moving, and velocity. These will help us figure out when the slider is still in motion versus when it has come to rest, so we can control hover effects more precisely. Finally, we have got a has actually dragged flag that helps us distinguish between a real drag and a click and is mobile flag so we can adjust layout based on screen width. The state object is what we'll be updating constantly as the user interacts with the slider, whether it's scrolling, dragging, or just hovering. Now that we have defined our config and state, we are ready to move on and start building the slides dynamically. First, I'm creating a simple utility function called check mobile. All it does is check the current screen width and if it's below 1000 pixels, we set a flag in our state object to true. This helps us adjust the layout for smaller screens later, mainly by reducing the size of each slide so the layout doesn't overflow or feel cramped on mobile devices. Next, let's create a function called create slide element. This is the function we'll call to generate one slide at a time. Inside it, I am starting by creating a div and giving it the class of slide. This will be the outer container for each individual item in the slider. If we are on a mobile screen, I'll shrink the width and height of the slide to make it more compact. That way, the slides don't take up too much space when viewed on smaller devices. Now, I'll create a div for the image container and give it the slide image class. Then we create the actual image element. We are using the current index to get the correct image from our slider's data array. But since we'll be duplicating slides later for the infinite scroll effect, we want to make sure we loop back to the start of the array when needed. To do that, I'm using the module operator. This way, even if the index goes beyond the data length, we wrap around and start from the beginning again. Next, I'll create the overlay that sits below the image. Inside that, I'm adding a paragraph tag for the project title and a small container for the arrow icon. The arrow icon is just an inline SVG, nothing interactive, just a visual cue. 
Now we'll attach a click event to the entire slide, but we don't want it to trigger if the user is in the middle of a drag. So here, I am checking the drag distance and only allowing the click if the user didn't actually drag much. If it's just a light tap or click, we navigate to the URL defined in the data array. Finally, I'll append all the child elements in order. The title and arrow go inside the overlay, the image goes inside the image container, then both the image container and overlay are added to the slide itself. And at the end, we return the fully constructed slide. We'll call this function multiple times in the next step to build the full track. Now that we have got the slide creation function ready, we'll move on to actually building the full set of slides and placing them inside the track. We'll start with a function called initialize slides. Inside it, I am first selecting the slide track container from the DOM and clearing out any existing content just in case this gets rerun on resize. Then we reset our internal slides array so we can rebuild it from scratch. Next, I'll call the check mobile function to update our mobile flag and based on that, I'll set the slide width. On smaller screens, we are shrinking each slide to around 215 pixels, otherwise we use the full desktop width of 390. Now we need to figure out how many slides we want to render. Since this slider is designed to loop infinitely, we'll need multiple copies of the same slides to simulate that illusion. So here, I'm multiplying the total slide count by 6 that gives us enough slides to scroll through without hitting a hard edge. Then I loop through that total and call our create slide element function for each one. Every slide gets appended on the track and I'll also store a reference to it in our state array so we can access them later for parallax updates. Once all the slides are added, I'll calculate a starting offset for the scroll position. We want the slider to begin somewhere in the middle of the loop so we are not too close to either end. I'm multiplying the original slide count by the slide width and shifting it left by two full loops. That becomes our starting x value and we assign it to both current x and target x. This is what gives the illusion of infinite scrolling in both directions because visually we are starting from the center of the repeated sequence. Next, we'll set up a function called update slide positions. This is what actually moves the track during scroll or drag. We start by calculating the full width of one loop of unix slides. Then we check whether we have scrolled too far to the left or too far to the right. If we cross either edge, we'll reset the position by shifting the current x value by exactly one sequence width, effectively wrapping us back into the center of the loop. It happens seamlessly so the user doesn't notice anything jumpy and we maintain the illusion of an endless track. After adjusting the position, we apply transform to move the entire track horizontally based on the current scroll position. Finally, let's talk about the parallax effect. I have created a function called update parallax. This runs on every frame and adjusts the position of each image based on how far it is from the center of the screen. So first, we calculate the center point of the viewport, then we loop through all the slides and get their bounding boxes. If a slide is too far off screen, say more than 500 pixels outside the viewport, we skip it entirely for performance. For the rest, we calculate the distance between the center of the slide and the center of the viewport. Then we use that distance to apply a horizontal transform on the image inside. The farther the image is from the center, the more we offset it in the opposite direction. This gives us a really smooth parallax effect where images feel like they are sliding at different speed compared to the rest of the content. The transform also maintains the same scale we defined earlier so the images stay zoomed in but shift left and right as the slider moves. And that's how we simulate depth and motion with just a bit of transform logic. Next, we'll move on to tracking velocity, over state and starting the animation loop. Let's start with the function called update moving state. Here, I'm calculating how fast the slider is moving by comparing the current x position to the one from the previous frame. We store that value as velocity and then immediately update the last current x so we can repeat this on the next frame. Now we want to check whether the slider has slowed down enough and has been still for long enough. If the velocity is very low and no scroll or drag has happened recently, we consider slider not moving. But if the user is still dragging or it's still gliding from inertia, we flag it as is moving true. Finally, I am syncing that flag with a CSS variable called slider moving. This is what we use in our styles to hide or show overlays based on whether the slider is in motion. It helps us avoid janky hover effects while dragging or scrolling. Now let's set up the animation loop. We'll create a function called animate. This is where we use linear interpolation to smoothly transition the slider's position from current x to a target x. Instead of snapping right away, we ease it across frames using love factor we defined earlier. After updating the position, I call our helper functions. We update the velocity state, we reposition the track and we apply the parallax offset to the images. And then we call request animation frame to loop this continuously synced with the browser's refresh rate. This gives a smooth, hardware accelerated animation on every scroll and drag. Now let's add all the interaction logic. First, we'll handle the wheel scroll in handle wheel function. 
I'm checking if the user is scrolling more vertically than horizontally. If not, we skip it. If it is a vertical scroll, we prevent the default behavior and update the target X value based on how far they scrolled. We also kept the max speed to avoid wild jumps. Next, we handle touch events for mobile. When the user touches the screen, we store the starting X value and reset the drag state. On move, we calculate how far they have dragged and adjust the target position. We are multiplying the drag distance a bit to make the slider feel more responsive. If the drag is large enough, we flag it as a real gesture which helps us cancel accidental link clicks later. On touch end, we reset the flags and clean up. We do something very similar for mouse interactions. On mouse down, we store the position and prep for drag. As the user moves, we calculate the drag delta and update the target position. If the movement is large enough, we mark it as an actual drag so we can avoid triggering clicks. When the mouse is released, we clear the flags and allow interaction again after a short timeout. We also listen for mouse leave events on the slider just in case the mouse leaves the bounce mid-drag. And we disable the default drag behavior entirely on the slider element to avoid ghost images. Now let's fire it all together. We'll create a function called initialize event listeners. This is where we attach all the handlers we just defined scroll, touch, mouse, and resize events so the slider responds to all types of input. And finally, we'll create the initialize slider function. This is our main setup function. It runs the slide generation, attaches the event listeners, and starts the animation loop. We call it inside a DOM content loaded event just to make sure everything is fully loaded before we begin. And that's it. The slider is now fully interactive, smooth, and infinitely scrollable. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.